This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. According to the Gallup polls, 97% of the American population believe in the existence of God. But in what sort of God do they believe? In a vague heavenly hypothesis, a nebulous nobody, a faraway ideal, and what difference would it make anyway? According to another survey, 42% of the men and women in the United States say they pray regularly. In England, the figure is 46%. But what is prayer? Does it work? And what does it accomplish? Why is it that according to another major psychological study, the higher one's IQ, the more likely he or she is to be interested in religion? What about life after death? Is there any such thing as eternal survival? 72% of the American people think that there is according to the statistics, but what do you think? And even if you did know you were going to live forever, what difference would it make to your daily routine way of life? the way you conduct your affairs. Who are you? Where did you come from? Where are you going? Why are you here? Are these questions which have answers, or are they the imponderables of the universe, problems without solutions, and one is better off not to ask? There was one Jesus of Nazareth who declared, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, free from fear, free from anxiety, from senseless uncertainty, from aimlessness, bewilderment, the torments of guilt. The truth shall make you free, he said, to live in joy, to live in inward liberty, to live in integrity and in peace, power and purpose for all the days of your life and all the days of your eternal life as well, forever, as you were born and created to live, as a son or daughter of God. But, someone may ask, how can one conceptualize or conceive of God? What are the possible understandings of the nature of this supreme being? One scholar of ancient history, Dr. Dina Justin of Iona College, writing in the publication Human Behavior, contends that until approximately the year 3000 B.C., most peoples of the world conceived God to be a woman. One of the earliest representations of deity is one 25,000 years before the birth of Christ, the mother goddess Venus, to whom were ascribed the powers of magic, prophecy, and self-transformation. But by the year 300 B.C., Dr. Justin writes, most God concepts had become masculine, with women being held responsible then for the origins of evil, as in the legend of Pandora and the story of Eve. Why has there almost inevitably, in the history of human thought, been the identification of God with either masculinity or femininity? Why is it that such terms as he and she have almost always been employed in the description of God? One answer is that the highest concepts of God are personal concepts. Human beings likely cannot conceive of personality apart from sexuality, since all the persons with whom people are acquainted are either male or female. Hence the almost inevitable result that human beings think of God in male or female terms. At best, this is but an imperfect attempt to portray the personality of God in a poetic or comparative fashion. Jesus of Nazareth undoubtedly employed the term father in describing God, in part because in the patriarchal Hebrew culture to which he spoke, that term was, in his opinion, the clearest he was able to employ. But it must be recognized that in the final assessment, no human word on earth is anywhere nearly sufficient for the describing of God. God is fatherly in the sense that God is personal. God can know and be known, love and be loved. But God is infinitely more than that. God is the source and center of all things. God is the creator, the controller, the upholder of all reality, the stability of the statics of this universe, the dynamism of all change around you and beyond you. And the incredible, the astounding, the almost unbelievable truth is that you, personally, believe it or not, are a son or daughter of this infinite, boundless, eternal, unlimited God. Believe that, recognize that, and your life will never again be the same, here, now, or eternally. But there are always skeptics. Recently, one West Coast University student wrote this editorial in his campus newspaper. It deals with the skeptical arguments frequently marshaled against religion. I quote, The scratchy old record keeps being played that some people need religion that it serves them as a crutch. For such people, religion is helpful, neurotic, and false. In a casual conversation, this may surface as the statement, your beliefs were taught you as a child, you feel insecure without them, and for you they're helpful, but I don't need them. This is the crutch theory of religion. Is it valid? No. Is it interesting? Yes. Notice first that the crutch theory is curiously reversible. 
Someone assures me that my faith in God is a neurotic crutch. The person says, you have projected a God complete with a huge religious framework so that you feel less threatened, more able to cope with the insecurities of your life, your adulthood. My reaction could be, actually, it's the reverse. You find it useful to deny God's reality because God threatens your sense of independence. You have a neurotic need to deny God. You unconsciously work out an ingenious secular framework to explain why some people have the ability to believe in God, but your atheism itself is a crutch. Closely related is the following incident reported by the late Harvard psychologist, Dr. Gordon Allport. A reckless young student who had a smattering of psychology once attacked Archbishop Temple with the accusation, you only believe what you believe because of your upbringing. The Archbishop promptly dispatched him with the reply, quote, you only believe that I believe what I believe because of my early upbringing because of your early upbringing. And thus the boomerang of logic returns. Consider this simple but valuable principle. The occasion of a belief is independent of its validity. To put it differently, someone may believe in God because he or she needs a crutch, but this says nothing whatever to disprove God's existence. God is quite real, quite independently of any and all theologizing and philosophizing about God, which mortals may do. God is a vital and available experience. And once any person has experienced God, no intellectual argument can deny that certainty. In what manner then, in what fashion, may one achieve this? Prayer, meditation, and worship are all spiritual techniques for the experiencing of God. One contemporary innovation in the children's toy market is the praying doll. For $9.95, you can buy a doll with snaps on its wrists, which can be attached together in order to make it appear that the doll's hands are clasped in prayer. The advertising goes on to say, nothing to wind up, this is a quote, nothing to wind up, no strings to pull. Whenever you want her to, this amazing doll says, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mother and dad, make me a good girl. And amen. The advertisement goes on to say, just press her tummy, and this doll recites the entire children's bedtime prayer. Her delightful voice, the advertisement says, comes on from a miniature record player in her tummy, and it operates on a single pen light battery. For anyone, for children and grown-ups alike, prayer can become that automatic, a senseless recitation of verbiage rather than the sincere desire of the soul, an inward outpouring. Authentic prayer is, in fact, a vital sense of sharing your life with God. It's not merely a memorized recitation of specific phrases and theological sentences. It's a living relationship with your Creator, your Father, whom to know is to love, to love for eternity. Because you are a child, a son or daughter of infinity and eternity. You may have forgotten your origins. You have perhaps but the dimmest recollection of your true spiritual heritage, that your soul was born in the instant of your first comprehending moral choice. For then it was that from galaxies away some seminal spirit impregnated your mind and something within you was born, your living soul, more valuable than all the earth and all it bears. For declared the master, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? There burns within you an enshackled splendor, an interior radiance, so brilliant, you may hesitate to believe that it could be there in such a seemingly commonplace person, but then are you really such a commonplace person? You are a son or daughter of the living God, black or white or red or yellow, whatever your ancestral background you are infinitely valuable. The experience of God is as available to you as your next breath of air. God loves you now. The kingdom of God is within you now. God has power for your life now. And if you will claim that by living faith now, you can and will find God, and you can and will find the beginnings of a new purpose and power and joy and love and peace and a good three dozen other things, many of which will be quite altogether unexpected. There is something intrinsically, inherently right, something which feels right about this concept of giving your life to God, 
the God who gave you your life in the first place. There's a simply inescapable soundness to the thought. Why is it that something within you, even now, is responding, confirming, agreeing with this? Is it merely a coincidence that you're tuned to this particular radio station right now? Or is there some sliver of a possibility that somewhere in this vast, star-spangled universe of universes, there is something or someone who wanted you to hear what you're hearing now, not fate. You have the utter freedom to tune your radio out at any moment and have no more of this, but could it just be that something in this universe or something in you wants you to hear about this more urgently than anything else you have ever heard in all your lifetime? Because it just could be, could it not, that this just could be the most important issue in all of time and eternity for you. Nothing less than God can satisfy your searchings of soul. God loves you boundlessly with an almost blinding affection. And if you will dare to believe that, to believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and begin in the most elementary sort of faith, to live as the son or daughter of God you were born to be and in truth you really are, your life and the world where you are, can begin to change because you can begin to change it. You can be a new person. A new feeling of meaning and value and purpose and energy will surge in your soul. In your soul, you have one. You are one. And to begin to live in this spiritual life in faith and hope and love for God and man is the beginning of a new and everlasting adventure. And it can begin for you Right here and right now, if you will have it so, said the Master of Masters, Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said, Be of good cheer. He said, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. There is joy, there is resilient, resounding gladness in being alive when you dare to begin to live in this faith, in this conscious belief, in this commitment that you are a child of God and every other person on this planet is likewise of infinite value. That God has a will, a plan, and a purpose, and a love for your life so transformative, so ebullient, so joyous that it can make life new for you. And then write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. The mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. We want to hear from you. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer. All this literature, yours free, no cost, charge, or obligation. When you write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that address, Box 3080 Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.